Are you an aspiring Jedi, or do you dabble with the dark side of the Force? Regardless of whether you fancy yourself a Defender of the Light or an aspiring Sith Lord, you're going to need a lightsaber. Podcast Stardust is pleased to partner with Saber Masters, the creators of high-quality, durable, and affordable lightsabers. Saber Masters is preparing to launch the Ultimate Lightsaber 2.0, and right now you can get two for the price of one. So, check out the link in our show notes and go get your Ultimate Lightsabers from Saber Masters. And don't forget to use our referral code STARDUST to save $10 at checkout. And each purchase using our referral code helps support Podcast Stardust. What's up, guys? This is Daniel Logan, Boba Fett from Attack of the Clones, The Clone Wars, Book of Boba, uh, Skywalker Star- Saga Game, uh, and hopefully many more things in the Star Wars galaxy. You are listening to Jay and Dennis on Podcast Stardust. Yep, this is the way I've spoken. Hello and welcome to Podcast Stardust. This is the fully armed and operational podcast dedicated to Star Wars news, reviews, and discussion. I'm Des Keithley. And I'm Jay Krebs. And our series celebrating the Phantom Menace for its 25th anniversary continues in this episode. But before we get to that, Jay, I want to remind everybody where we can be found around the internet. Sure thing, Dennis. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, conveniently at Podcast Stardust. All right, the dish is lying, the signal's boosted to maximum output, the shield is down, we are now broadcasting to the galaxy. So this is part nine in our ongoing series of The Phantom Menace, nine of 12, I should say. Um, if you have not listened to one of these episodes before, what we've been doing is uh, we take a movie with an anniversary and then we divide it up into roughly 10 to 15 minute chunks and we do one of those episodes over uh, a month over the course of a year. And so we can pay a little bit more attention to all the moments that come in the movie. So uh, tonight we are discussing the segment of the movie that runs from one hour, 33 minutes and seven seconds to one hour, 44 minutes and 38 seconds. Typically we have a guest uh, on this, but due to a number of factors, uh, including illness and some other health related issues over the past month, uh, Jay and I just been kind of behind the eight ball and, we weren't able to get our ducks in a row to get an, a guest in this. We kind of got started late on that process and just didn't work out. And unfortunately, this is like a second month in a row that this has happened and that just doesn't happen. So we're going to try hard for next month and hopefully mm-hmm. we'll have someone to come and discuss it with us. Um, but with that being said, Jay, let's go ahead and dive into this segment. Jay, this is really the setup for Act 3. And it's kind of detailing everything that's going to happen from both the light side point of view and then what the dark side expects to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. And it all starts in the Jedi council chamber. So Anakin has had his testing, which we discussed on the previous episode in the series. And now he's standing there with Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon is eagerly expecting the results of all this. And he's informed that Anakin is not going to be trained. He is too old. And Qui-Gon responds to that. Well, you know, he is the chosen one. Surely must see that. And in defiance of the council's proclamation, he says he's going to train Anakin and take him as his Padawan learner. Yoda objects to that by saying, you already got a Padawan. You can't take two to which Qui-Gon responds. Well, Obi-Wan's ready for the trials. So test him. And Obi-Wan steps and said, yeah, I am ready. Mm-hmm. And then Yoda rebuts that. It's like, well, our own council will keep on who is ready. Okay. So they put this whole thing aside and instruct Qui-Gon to escort the queen back to Naboo because that's where she's going. What stands out to you here the most about this portion? Well, you know, it's so hard for me sometimes to put myself in the mind frame of, you know, seeing this for the first time. And as much as I try to do that, it's both kind of a blessing and a curse that we have so much more supplemental information since Mm -hmm. this came out. 
And, you know, there's a couple of things that, that stand out to me, you know, is, as far as being too old to start the training. When I first saw this, we didn't really know anything about how Jedi were ever trained. We didn't know what the hierarchy was. We didn't know what the procedure was. All we had ever gotten before this was just Luke being thrown into this role and, you know, he was 19. So, you know, that's definitely much older than Anakin. So it was very fresh and new to think that these Padawans were so young and that there was this kind of cutoff to where they were considered acceptable. But Mm -hmm. of course, you know, we know so much more now about why that is. And, you know, I think too, with everything that we've gotten from the High Republic, it just puts more of an exclamation point on why Yoda is so adamant about, nope, too too old he is to start the training. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then we've got Qui-Gon, who, of course, as we know from the books and from the supplemental information, is so about these prophecies. And he is just convinced that, you know, Anakin is the chosen one. As you said, you know, you must see this. And not that the council is necessarily disputing that, but part of me wonders, you know, with Qui-Gon's track record and everything that Obi-Wan has always said, you know, don't defy the council of master, not again, you know, kind of thing. What did, what did Qui-Gon actually expect? You know, did he really expect them to just fawn over Anakin like oh my gosh yes he is the chosen one and we have to make this exception and you know and all of these different kinds of things so there's that and then with Obi-Wan it kind of surprised me that he was so eager to step in and say I am ready because Mm -hmm. he was so against you know this pathetic life form you know kind of a thing joining them again and he was questioning Qui-Gon's decision from the very, very beginning. And we get a lot of that even more in the novelization as well. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot there that you're talking about. And as you pointed out, you know, from the subsequent material that we got here, we know that Anakin may be too old to be brought into the Jedi Order, but he's also very young for someone to take as a Padawan. You know, they're usually, they go on for a few more years and it's not until they become a teenager that they're taken on. As a pat, you know, like Ahsoka was what thirteen, right? Yeah, when she became Anakin's uh, Padawan. <clears throat> so there's that, and then you know there's this notion that uh, Obi Wan steps up, says, "I am ready for the trials," and then Yoda smacks him down. But you know he's all eager to do this. But Qui Gon then says, you know, he's got some things to learn. He he you know he uh, he still has stuff to learn about the Living Force, but there's nothing left that I can teach him here and the first time first several times i watched this i didn't even really pick up on this kind of like a backhanded way of talking about all we want which is yeah you can try go ahead and put him through trials he's he's got some things to learn but i'd really rather train this kid who i believe to be the chosen one and i don't think until i really stopped and considered this portion of the movie and the detail that we're talking here that i really could see this from obi-wan's point of view which is you paid me a compliment, then you snatched it right back by by basically saying my training really isn't complete. You just can't do it anymore. And mm-hmm. it's really kind of a, uh, it's not a great way of saying, I just rather train, I need to train this kid. So I'm throwing Obi-Wan to the wolves. Yeah. Yeah. And I do remember feeling that way, you know, thinking mm-hmm. back to like poor Obi-Wan, you know, all of a sudden it, he's getting his back turned you know, on him. Mm-hmm. And, and now the, the focus is no longer on his training. But then again, I thought, well, you know, knowing what we knew about Obi-Wan in the original trilogy is that, you know, he's, he's very strong and that he goes on to do some amazing things anyways, regardless. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. It's like, cause the, the Jedi council's firm here about Anakin, he's too old and we're not going to train him. And then, in the next, we can bleed over to the next scene here, which is the landing platform. Obi Wan is protesting with Qui Gon. It's like, you know, he, he's defying the council. They all sense that the boy is dangerous. You know, why can't you see this? And you know, Qui Gon's like, "Oh, I'm going to do what I must here." And again, they all end up by the end of this movie putting these concerns aside because of the performance Anakin gave in the Battle of Naboo, but. Again, even up to this point in the movie, Obi-Wan is still a doubter. He does not believe in Anakin at all. 
he, he may believe that he understands he's got this power, but this power has got an inherent danger that comes with it. Right. Right. Okay. So moving on to the landing platform, like I said, it starts off with Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon having a dispute about training Anakin and Obi-Wan professing that he's dangerous. And then, you know, Qui-Gon has not given up on the council changing their mind. He says the council decide Anakin's future at a later time because they've been instructed to now take the queen back to Naboo. And he says, you know, he dismisses Obi-Wan again, you know, get on board. <laughs> this, is, this is not your police to, to question me here. I, you know, I really feel for Obi-Wan. <laughs> the mm-hmm. more I think about it here, I really feel bad for him in this instance. Yeah, no, you bring up some really good points because again, you know, he's, he's sort of the, you know, the, the next kid is born and then the older sibling gets, I don't want to say tossed aside, you know, but all of a sudden all of the attention goes towards the baby. And mm-hmm. so that's kind of what's happening here in a lot of ways. But, you know, then again, I mean, Anakin set ends up saying, you know, he doesn't want to be a problem. Like all of a sudden he realizes that people are talking about him and that he is the source of strife and he can feel that and Mm -hmm. he doesn't want to add to that. And so it's just, it goes back to what he was doing on tattooing, you know, with his mom and being a slave in the whole nine yards that, you know, he just, he just wanted to bring, you know, help to other people and he didn't want it to come to where he's being seen as the source of something that had to be helped. Right. Yeah, indeed. And then again, it's just the, and again, with Obi-Wan here, he was just saw Qui-Gon talking about how there's nothing left that he can teach him and that he's ready for the trials. And then again, he made the comment about, well, you know, he's, he's said strong and he's got much learn of the living force. And now, you know, the, Obi-Wan should be potentially an equal. He doesn't pass the trials, but he's ready for the trials. He's ready to be a Jedi Knight and Qui-Gon just dismisses him again. <laughs> so you know that i could see what this and then to your point about anakin you know he says you know mr qui-gon sir i don't want to be a problem yeah and i think qui-gon kind of takes a deep breath and he gets down on anakin's level and he's talking about you know you know i can't train you but stay close you know observe me and we'll get this figured out at a later time and then anakin asks about midi chlorins you know I heard Yoda talking about mini chlorines. I've been wondering, what are mini chlorines? <laughs> I wish they'd come up a different way to deliver that line, but it is what it is. <laughs> and Qui Gon explains, in the best detail we've had so far in this movie, that they're microscopic life forms that live inside all living cells. They're symbionts, and life couldn't exist without them. And then, without the mini chloriums, that they would have no knowledge of the Force. And when Anakin learns to quiet his mind, he will hear them speaking to him. When this movie came out, Midi chlorines are quite controversial. Oh yeah, and we've talked a little bit about this so far in the series before, I should say. What do you think about this explanation here? For me, I remember when I heard it, I was like, "Oh, okay, that makes sense." I, I didn't even question it. You know, mm-hmm. I just thought that, and and I just I know, especially at the time, I was just so ready to gobble up anything that I mean, you could have sold me sour blue milk and I would have drank it. You know what I mean? So it Mm -hmm. was at the time it was just all new and all different. And we were just getting so much more information about everything that we always wondered about that was like, okay. Uh, Yeah. I got to say, you know, it's at the time it ran counter to the very limited amount of legend stuff we had because uh, when Luke was going around the galaxy, trying to find people that could use the force and legends, he was doing some sort of a, connection with them and then there'd be like a pushback and it had nothing to do with midi chlorines whatever and so fine mm-hmm. it's not a complete contradiction but it is different than what we were learning about in the legends canon and so midi chlorines get elevated to be this really important thing anakin had a midi chlorine count as we found out in a prior segment that was higher than anything that obi-wan or qui-gon had ever seen even higher than yoda's and then they've now completely pulled away from that in ahsoka where, you know, Sabine had a very low midi chlorine count, but by the end of that series, she was capable of using the force mm-hmm. again. And prior to that, midi chlorines had kind of been de emphasized with Star Wars. And it's kind of almost like reluctantly addressed anymore, I feel like, in Star Wars when it comes down to it. Yes and no. And, you know, you bring up a good point because it's it's kind of the 
I don't want to say taboo subject necessarily, but it's one that is not, it's, it's not very consistent either because mm -hmm. we see, you know, the M count being talked about in places like the Mandalorian mm -hmm. and in the bad batch, you know, with Omega and, you know, that kind of thing. So it's sort of all over the place in terms of its importance and the mm -hmm. role that it plays in different kinds of things. And so, you know, you, you brought up a good point with Sabine because yeah, she did have, you know, what they suspected to be this, this low midichlorian count. So is, you know, and again, it, it kind of begs to ask the question, well, is there the living force or is it the cosmic force? Like which one is at play here? Does it matter? And so that, that just opens up a whole new can of conversation. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Just when it comes down to the M count, it's, you know, as you brought up, it's kind of like, well, what's the point? I mean, because, right? yeah. you know, ultimately it's not been proven to be necessary. And now I guess I do need to pull back from that statement because yeah, in the Mandalorian, right. You know, that's Grogu's blood is what they wanted in order to make the clones of Gideon and stuff like that. But still mm -hmm. again, many clones aren't even like discussed much specifically there. It's just always, it's, I don't know. It, it, it's just not terribly consistent. And uh, it puts me in a mind, like when we were talking about <laughs> Sabine, uh, Mandalorians, like never removing their helmets just after we watch Sabine remove hers all the time. Right. And rebels and stuff like That's that. That's a so, good comparison. And then they came up with an explanation of that, you know, children of the watch versus other Mandalorians, which, you know, we'd mm -hmm. seen across clone Wars. So, yeah. Okay. Well, Qui-Gon greets the queen and, you know, she says, well, you know, Senator Palpatine fears that the Federation means to destroy me. And he assures her that they won't let that happen. And then, Jar Jar lets out a fantastic Yahoo, where's it going home? And then Anakin and mm -hmm. R2 also get on the ship behind all of them. All right, so they're headed back to Naboo. But our next scene is in Theed Palace, which is occupied by the Trade Federation. And we see the various Nymodians, including New Gunray, meeting with Sidious via hologram. And they claim to be in complete control of the planet. And of course, Sidious knows that Amidala and the Jedi are on the way there. The movie is not revealed to us, and they never do, that Sidious and Palpatine are the same person, but he informs them that he is sending Darth Maul to join them, and then, of course, after the hologram flickers away, I can't reach one of the numb and says, like, another Sith, you know, they're coming here, <laughs> so they're a little <laughs> alarmed by all that. Um, it's a very short, short scene, but as I said at the beginning of the discussion, this really is a lot of setup for Act 3 of the movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And just the idea that the Nemoidians are kind of losing control, you know, over mm -hmm. what's going on. And so you can kind of feel that that tension building up and just the fact that Maul is being sent there is, is amping it up even more. Mm -hmm. And then we end up back at the Queen's ship. And for like the first time, we've got Rick O'Leary doing something that, other than describing things that we can see on screen <laughs> for ourselves as he is teaching Anakin about the ship's controls, you know, the pitch and everything else. And, and we know that we learned that Anakin is a quick learner. And this is a very subtle way of us learning about how Anakin gets brought up to speed so that he can actually pilot the N1 Starfighter later mm -hmm. in this movie. Mm -hmm. Very clever. Right. And then we go to the back of the ship where Panaka and Qui-Gon are talking to the queen. And the point that they're making is, is that we don't understand what you're trying to accomplish here. As soon as you land, the trade Federation is going to arrest you and then force you to sign this treaty that you fled from Naboo in the first place. And her response is that, is that I'll take back what's ours. And then you know, it's pointed out to her, well, you don't have an army. And the only thing that Jedi can do is protect her. They can't fight a war for her. And this is when she speaks up and says that she need Jar she needs Jar Jar's help. So hey, reactions to this brief scene. Well, you know, I think that Padme had it in her head all along after she had had that talk with Jar Jar, so to speak, you know, when Jar Jar said, we have a grand army. Yes. She had it in there in her head that this is what's going to happen. And she mm -hmm. didn't you know, expand on that for either Panaka or Qui-Gon. She just simply said, I'll take back what's ours, you know, and that's all she needed to say. And she didn't need to have a whole lot of exposition. She was going to let her her actions speak louder than any words. Definitely, yeah. And when Jar Jar had that conversation with her back in Palpatine's 
quarters on course that that's what that was the genesis of this idea mm -hmm. that she has here about how they're going to fight the trade federation because there's no hope there's no to, for help coming from the senate there in Coruscant because they want to send a commission and that's going to take way too long uh you know her people are going to suffer and die if she allows that to, to happen and so it, it's you know i was trying to think back uh, to my initial viewing of this 25 years ago and i couldn't remember if i was putting these pieces together or not, because of course the trailers featured an army of Gungans emerging from the swamps and then mm -hmm. fighting later with battle droids. But whether that was, yeah, I was, you know, that just was happening or we knew that this was a plan concocted by Amidala, I wouldn't have been able to tell you. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Okay. So they get to Naboo, they're in space, they see that there's one Trade Federation ship that remains of this blockade. Again, it's a little clue, a little foreshadowing about what's going to be important things to come, but otherwise they don't spend any more time on it. And then we watch the ship as it comes in for landing uh, and does so in the forest. And then we find out that uh, uh, Jar Jar is his way to Gungan City, as Obi-Wan tells Qui-Gon this. And then Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon have a bit of a heart-to-heart -heart, um, that... You know, he says, you know, he apologizes for his behavior regarding Anakin. It's not his place to dispute what should happen to the boy. And then Qui-Gon says that, you know, you've been a good apprentice and you're a much wiser man than he is. He foresees him becoming a great Jedi someday. What do you think about this uh, reconciliation? Well, I think in some ways, I I, I truly believe Qui-Gon, you know, that his sentiment is, is very heartfelt. But then again, I wonder how much of it is just placating Obi-Wan, you know, especially as we've been talking about this whole particular segment uh this time around and how obi-wan is is sort of pushed aside and mm -hmm. i almost wonder if that was the whole genesis of of why qui-gon said this to him but then you know i can't help but to think that he he is sincere and qui-gon has spent so much time teaching obi-wan that he wants the best for him and he wants to see him succeed and you know and quite honestly it's not too unlike the conversation that obi-wan has with anakin in revenge okay. of the sith yes i'm glad you said that because if you didn't i was going to bring that up but go on yeah no it's the same thing you know where he says you know you have become a much wiser Jedi than I could ever be, you know, and I'm, I'm so, I, I can't remember his exact words, but it's, it, it just reminded me of that conversation. And I'm sure you probably know them, the words better because you always are such a great eidetic memory kind of person. And I'm not. <laughs> well, right. This is in Revenge of the Sith. There comes that scene on Coruscant where Obi-Wan and Anakin are saying their goodbyes and Anakin's apologizing for his frustrations and that he's disappointed Obi-Wan and I haven't been grateful of your teaching and those type of things. And then, you know, Anakin and Obi-Wan's response is like, you know, I'm very proud of you. I've raised you from a small boy. I've taught you everything I know, but be patient. They'll, it won't be long before the council makes you a Jedi master. And, you know, Anakin's lamenting that he's not able to go with them. And they have a clear separation. The next time they see each other, they're on opposite sides. It's right. Jedi versus Sith as opposed to Jedi versus Jedi. And this is not the last time that Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan talk to each other. There's communications that happen between them mm -hmm. to a degree before the end. But this is the last heart to heart that they get to have, which mm -hmm. is what makes it so reminiscent of that scene in Revenge of the Sith here. They're having that reconciliation and it's not intended as a goodbye and farewell, but it's not the same after this. Right. And yeah. it is nice that they had this opportunity to have this reconciliation. And just like in Revenge of the Sith, where that scene is sad, when you see it the second time, after you know what's going to happen between Anakin and Obi-Wan, there's a bit of sadness that comes with this. And on the one hand, you're happy that they're able to put the, you know, you know, let Gygons be Gygons and put things behind them, you know, because they, they're not going to get another opportunity to do it. But again, this is, this is it. This is their last real moment as master and padawan yeah and when you put it that way it really is a very sad moment in a lot mm -hmm. of ways yeah for sure okay well then jar jar returns and he tells them that there's nobody in gungan city the whole place has been abandoned and then there's some discussion with Qui-Gon and panaka that uh, you know they either fled panaka thinks they've been wiped out and then jar jar stands up for the pride of his people by says, you know, Mino thinks so, you know, and there's danger. Dungeons go to sacred place, you know, come Misa show you. 
And so, you know, he's going to take them off to okay. the first time I saw this movie, I laughed because I thought he said guns go to secret place. And then the next breath he was saying, I'm going to take you to the secret place. It's <laughs> supposed to be a secret charge, but it's not that it's a sacred place. And then we get a very pivotal scene. They go to the sacred place and we've got some mounted Gungans escorting them to the bosses. Uh, boss Nass and the other bosses are standing on top of the statue and you know, the fake queen Sabe begins to make her presentation before Padme interrupts and says, no, I'm the queen. And, you know, she apologizes for the deception. Um, I'm pretty sure Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan were on to her the entire time. Oh, yeah. totally. uh, Jar Jar and Anakin are surprised by this, but then Amidala, Padme, whatever you want to call her, makes this very impassioned speech about how, you know, we've been separate but we need your help. Uh, everything we've built will be destroyed if we don't stand up to the Trade Federation. You know, so I ask you, no, I beg you, and she kneels, and then everyone gets down on knees with her. And this is very moving to Boss Nass, who says, you know, you so no tinkin, you so greater than the Gungans, me so like this. Maybe we so be in friends. And of course, an alliance is born. I feel like, and we've had this conversation before, that it wasn't really a big surprise that Padme and Amidala were the same person here. But what do you think of this reveal? Oh, it was well done. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head when you said that it was no surprise to Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan and you could see it on their faces. And, you know, for Anakin, just being so young, it, it was a shocker for him for mm -hmm. sure. But I think he was very, you know, excited that Padme actually was the queen, but also maybe, thought to himself, Ooh, you know, what does this do? Like, what is, how does this change things for us? Does this change things? Cause you could, you just know Anakin's wheels are turning in his head, mm -hmm. but I mean, this is just the first step in what she had said on the ship when she said, I'll take back what's ours. You know, mm -hmm. that was, she was going to do it. And this was what was going to happen. And, you know, I have to ask though, I, I don't know enough if there's any kind of explanation for why this particular place was the sacred place for the Gungans, because the the statues and such that are there are not very Gungan looking. You know not what I Gungan mean? Gungan looking at all. <laughs> yeah. And so how does it be how how has it become sacred for them, especially because they typically live underwater in the planet core? So not well, that I, you know that, but yeah. I, I, you know, that's a good point. I, I hadn't thought to check Wikipedia for anything like that. And I don't know if there's been anywhere that that's been established, but there is like a number of these toppled statues in right. this area that like are in the swamp and then in the grasslands around the swamp. And um, so what the history is behind that, I'm, I'm not certain. Yeah. It makes me think a little bit of even something like Jedha, you know, where we see mm -hmm. the fallen Jedi temple and the, the statues and that type of thing. But I mean, those are obviously Jedi when these are obviously not Gungans. So mm -hmm. it just makes me wonder. Yeah. I got to say, the expression that Jake Lloyd has on his face when Padme reveals herself to be the queen is probably the, and I don't want to pick on him, and this is not to disparage anything else he's necessarily done in this movie, but this was probably the best acting he did in the entire <laughs> movie. Well, just the utter look of shock and disbelief on his face. He's like, and, I'm like and all right, you know, that's all yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, uh, you know, Jar Jar's reaction is also priceless. Sure. This, you know, what? I can't do the noise, but uh, there is that. I'm um, I, I'm just kind of wondering at the moment, and this is train of thought, stream of conscious, and I hadn't really come to any conclusions here. But obviously, you know, Sabe has been posing as the queen for Amidala's protection here. But I kind of wonder why they went through with this up until this point. Why didn't Padme just prepare herself as the queen? to make this presentation from the get go. And how far was she going to let Sabe go with making this plea before she, you know, what, what was the original plan before she interjected here? Yeah. I think part of it is for Padme. She wanted to still try to keep her identity hidden mm -hmm. as a handmaiden. And that maybe there was a point where she just felt that Sabe was not getting that job done. And so she mm -hmm. felt like she had to step in, but yeah, that's a good point. Why wouldn't she have just done that in, in the first place? But the only thing that I can think of is that she wanted to, you know, there would have been a question to maybe Anakin and Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan that, 
and why, you know, why is, where is Padme? Like, why isn't she here? Well, yeah, because to your point there, when they board the queen's ship on Coruscant, Padme is Amidala mm -hmm. right then. There's no Padme wandering around. And Anakin doesn't notice this, which you think he would have. Right. At that point. And then when they're on the ship, Padme is clearly Amidala putting forth her plan to you know reach out to jar jar to have him go recruit the gun you know to you know make a connection with the gungans there and so they then had to swap roles before they got off the ship mm -hmm. uh, so again a lot of costume changes there um but uh, a little weird that a lot of people now the only of course the jedi both knew and they weren't going to give away that she <laughs> that she wasn't uh you know, that, that sabe wasn't really the queen and there. And so it's really only two people on the ship. Now that I'm thinking this out loud, Anakin and Jar Jar that don't realize that yeah. Padme is the queen and that, you know, that, that there's this subterfuge going on here. Exactly. Which, uh, yeah. They're kind of yeah. left out. <laughs> of the scene. Yeah, very true. Yeah. Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon figured out that Clark Kent was Superman a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Someday we're gonna have to sit down and do like a detailed discussion of when the switches happen and who knew when and that type yeah. of thing. But uh, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> discussion for another podcast. There you go. Okay, and then Boss Nass is now uh, firmly on the side of the Naboo, and they're gonna go fight this war together. Uh, back at Theed Palace, Gunray is reporting to Sidious, and we find out that they've already found the Queen ship in the swamp, and. Now Sidious is saying this is an unexpected move for her. It's too aggressive. And then he cautions Darth Maul, you know, Lord Maul, be mindful. Let them make the first move. Does this make sense to you? Because we now know Palpatine and Sidious are the same person. What was Palpatine expecting Amidala to go back to Naboo and do? Well, I think he just underestimated her, you know, because she mm -hmm. was so young and because the fact that Palpatine is from Naboo, he probably, you know, obviously knew a little bit of the history of her family and her election and her, you know, rising to that particular point in her, her queendom, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, he was kind of feeding off of that and didn't think that she would be that aggressive. I mean, that's the only thing that I could think of. I guess, but I'm also thinking ahead to Return of the Jedi when Sidious goes around saying things like this, he all has proceeded as I have foreseen. Ah, uh, yeah. Good and point. so Amidala leaves Coruscant saying, I'm going back to Naboo. I'm going to take what's ours. I'm going to fight for our people. You know, this is your arena. I'm going back to mine. And, you know, he couldn't have been expecting her just to show up on Naboo and surrender. So, mm -hmm. I, again, this is a minor nitpick, but... Uh, I guess that just shows that, you know, when as much as Qui-Gon believes in prophecies, there's blind spots there. And as much as Palpatine believes in his visions and his ability to see things in the future for the dark side of the force, he has his blind spots as well. Well, yeah, for sure. Well, and it just reminds me of, you know, I, I really honestly think that he wanted her to be eliminated completely. Mm -hmm. He really did oh, yeah. because there was that one point where she's like, I'm going back to Naboo. And he, you could almost hear it in his voice like, oh, wait, no, stop. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. Well, yeah. He kind of but he's like, smirk as soon as she go, leaves go, the go, door. Go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is, yeah, because the thing is like, well, if she's on course, and we had this conversation last time, you know, if right. she's on course, and he can still try to manipulate her. Mm -hmm. But if she goes back to Naboo, well, then she can be arrested and forced to sign the treaty. And then she can perish, and then she's no longer a thorn in his side. And of course, none of those things happen. Right. So, okay. Well, we get to the last bit here, and they're still in the sacred place. We see the Naboo speeders returning, um, and then uh, Anakin gets the news from the one Gungan on top of the another statue, and he runs to tell everyone that they're back. And you know, there they are. They show up right behind him. But you know, youthful enthusiasm there, I suppose. And then Boss Nass is. You know, all's forgiven with Jar Jar. You know, you are doing grand things. Uh, we make you bomb bad general. And then, of course, Jar Jar faints with this news. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure that was the best choice that Boss Nass could have made in that situation. <laughs> you know, Jar Jar being is, is, does some instrumental things in the battle that comes up, but it's not like his leadership made the difference. 
No, but I think that for Boss Nass, anyways, he just saw the fact that Jar Jar was able to bridge that gap. And mm-hmm. so, you know, he felt like it was sort of a quid pro quo, maybe kind of a thing that let bygones be bygones with his clumsiness. And, you know, because they brought the Naboo together with the Gungans that he was promoting him. But it was funny when Jar Jar's like, oh, no, 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 you know, mm-hmm. and he's like, oh, you know, all these accolades. And then he faints. I remember that I, that really elicited some giggles out of my niece and nephew too in the theater. Oh, sure. I'll never forget that. That was cute. Yeah. Well, you know what else could have done? It's like pen on middle on them or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know I've been snarky when we talk about this entire segment this entire time, but I love this movie and I do enjoy all of this. But again, when you're paying this much close attention to the movie, some things just start to stand out. To sure. So, yeah. Um, but then Panaka reports that uh, everyone being the Naboo are been rounded up and they're currently in camps except for a few hundred police and guards, which have created some sort of an underground resistance movement. And then we get into the queen's plan. So the gun guns are going to draw the army away from the city. And this is a diversion. And while that is happening, they being Amidala, the Jedi and her guards are going to enter the city using secret passages on the waterfall side. But when they get to the main entrance, Panaka creates another diversion. And then they enter the palace and capture the Viceroy. And when asked what he thinks about this, Qui-Gon responds, well, you know, it's an interesting plan, but a lot of gun guns could get killed. And Boss Nass basically reports that they're ready to make the sacrifice, or more specifically, we so ready to do awesome pot. Uh, I'm enjoying impersonating nice. him. So, <laughs> And then the fact comes up, was like, well, you know, you're going to get overwhelmed by the battle droids. And then she springs the next part of the plan. It's like, well, we got pilots. They're going to get in their fighters, and they're going to go up and knock out the droid control ship. But of course, the flaw with that is that the shields may prevent the fighters from doing that. And Qui-Gon says, you know, well, this is a well-conceived plan, but there's great risk. Uh, there's great risk. You know, if the Viceroy escapes, he could come back with another droid army. And you know, she, she says, like, well, that's why everything depends on us capturing the Viceroy. And so as we've been talking about, this entire segment is really the setup for Act 3. It's putting all the pieces in place and giving the audience an idea of what they can expect going forward in this movie, what the plan is used by countless movies. You know, they give you an idea of the plan and then either the plan happens or it gets subverted you know, or twists and things happen. But here we are, we've got the plan. I can't say that it, there's necessarily anything wrong with it. It's the best that they can do with what they've got to work with there. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's very much like Rogue One in that way. You know, mm-hmm. the, they they had to go to Scarif. They had to do it this way. You know, Jin gives her a speech about, you know, we take the next chance and the next and on and on until the chances are spent or, you know, we're successful one or the other. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Padme basically says, this is it. This, we're doing this and we mm-hmm. will not fail. This is everything depends on this. So it's the same thing. Like everything depends on getting, you know, the plans to the Death Star. It's It's kind of the same thing. So you know, again, Star Wars is like poetry. It rhymes in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Poetry is when you're using the ring theory and the poetry stuff, that's especially apropos when you're talking about the Skywalker saga and especially the first six episodes Mm -hmm. of the saga here. And this is one of those moments because there's nothing else here. It's, you know, the, the Gungans are going to, or the Gungans, the Nymodians and the trade federation are going to go forward with their plans on Naboo, whether she's around or not, you know, they'll, probably end up forging her signature on a treaty if they have to, especially if she gets killed in all this, but they're holding the fate of her people over her head. And as we've already talked about several times now, she can't, there's no other option. The Senate's not going to act fast enough. The courts aren't going to act fast enough. A commission is likely to be corrupted once it gets there. And, you know, of course, by the end of this movie, we find out that Palpatine wins the chancellorship, but that wasn't assured. And even if he did, he still has to work through the procedure of the Senate to get anything done. And so her hand is forced on behalf of her, uh, of her people. And, you know, maybe the execution isn't an A plus in all of this, but it does work when it comes down to it. It does. And I just, I love the way that they portray Padme is just like the mama bear of Naboo. You know, it's like mm-hmm. you mess with my people. Oh, no, you don't, you know, kind mm-hmm. of a thing. I just, I love that. Yeah. She's got a fierceness and a confidence when it yep. comes to dealing with the situation. And, you know, later, this is a feature that Leia will inherit. Right. Yeah. So true. Mm-hmm. Well All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the segment. You got any other concluding thoughts on this before we 
put a bow on this one? No, I'm just, I'm always so grateful that we do these segments. It's, I look forward to it all the time. And I remember the one time you said, it's just great to have that in that Disney plus queue every Mm -hmm. month and just know that you can look forward to seeing it all year long. Definitely. Yeah. Of course, it's like, if I want to watch this movie, I have to mark down where I was so that I can come back and do it and set it up for the next segment here. But uh, yeah, no, this is fun. I'm I'm glad we get to do these too. It's, I know it's, it's one of the more popular things we do here on podcast Stardust. We get a lot of response to this, uh, you know, on our various platforms and uh, I enjoy bringing it to everyone. And it's even more fun when we can get a guest, but uh, Hey, things happen and life is life and it comes at you fastest or they say, but uh, we'll try and get a guest for next time. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, then, thank you all for joining us for this episode of Podcast Stardust in our ongoing series celebrating the Phantom Menace for its 25th anniversary. We hope you've enjoyed this. If you haven't done so already, if you're a new listener to Podcast Stardust, hit that subscribe button, and then you'll make uh, that'll make sure you get the next entry on this episode uh, of this series, I should say, when it drops next month. And while you're at it, if you're looking for the back episodes. I try to link to the previous entry in the series in the show notes, but another place to go is to head over to RetrosApp.com our entire catalog, the previous 785 episodes are there. Uh, you know, you can typically find one of these episodes about every 12 or so, and they're all labeled the Phantom Menace, you know, part eight, part seven, whatever. They're not particularly hard to find that way. Uh, and check them out. Uh, we have a lot of fun with this. And like I said, it's one of the things we're renowned for. And so I invite you all to, to, to check those episodes out if you haven't done so already. But while you're at RetroZap, you can uh, find other great uh, podcasts that are part of the rest of that podcast network, including Agents of Shield Case Files, Animaniacast, Bruise and Blasters, Dork Lair, Doomcast, Enjoy Stuff, Love Death and Robots Plus, Superhero Suite, and Warp Trails. And if we could be so bold to ask for a few favors, uh, number one, we'd love it if you could leave us a rating and review on your podcatcher of choice. Uh, those five star ratings and written reviews really help the show get noticed by others. And if you could uh, share the show with your friends that might uh, enjoy Star Wars or this type of discussion, whether that's by word of mouth or sharing on social media, that's another great way to help others notice the show. So with those things in mind, Jay, remind everybody what our other social media contacts are and where else we can found around the internet. You also can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and X conveniently at Podcast Stardust. And we also have tons of Pinterest boards that you can check out for all kinds of fun ideas, Star Wars related, of course. And then as Dennis was running down earlier with all of our different outlets that you can listen to us on, we are on both the regular YouTube as well as YouTube music. And those do support not only subscriptions, but they also support reviews and interactions. So if you'd like to interact with us, you can do that on those platforms as well as on our Discord page, or I'm sorry, our Discord room, which is part of the RetroZap Discord server. And the link to that is in our show notes. So if you want to do some real-time chatter, you can hit us up there. And then we also have a couple other links that you can check out. One is to our T Public Store, where you can pick up something with a Podcast Artist logo on it. We actually have seven different show logo designs available. And so you can check out our t-shirts, sweatshirts, coffee mugs, all kinds of things over there. And every one of those purchases does help to support the show. And another way that you can help to support the show is by picking up a battle ready lightsaber from Saber Masters or two. They have the ultimate lightsaber 2.0 right now going on for a buy one, get one deal. And so if you do happen to get something, make sure you put the code Stardust in at checkout and that will get you an extra $10 off of your purchase. And it also does help to support podcast Stardust. And we'd really appreciate it if you would do that. All right. Before we go, Jay, remind everybody what you got going on in the world of cosplay. Sure. So I'm just coming off of a special guest appearance at the Cleveland Gaming Classic this past weekend. So you can check out my Instagram, which is at j.snipscosplay for a recap of all of the fun there. And so you can check out my pictures as Ahsoka and Weird Barbie, as well as my other, you know, mains, which would be Hera, two different versions of Hera, my fourth sister, as well as my original concept Mandalorian. And you just never know what else you're going to find. So once again, that is on Instagram at j.snipscosplay. Okay. Upcoming on the show on Friday, it's our weekly look at Star Wars news. Then on Monday, we resume our The Clone Wars rewatch with episode, I believe it's seven of season one. So with that, uh, thanks for listening to episode 786 of Podcast Starters, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. And until next time, may the Force be with you.